Right, good morning everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar, the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce and HS2. Um, I am your host, Sonny Rana, Account Manager at the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce. That's me there. Um, if you need to get in contact with me for whatever reason, my contact details are on the slide in front of you. I'm pleased to announce our speaker for today, Matt Haddington. He's the Senior Business Manager, or Engagement Manager, shall we say, for HS2 Limited. He'll be taking us through um, some of the reasons why businesses should get involved in the HS2 project, what's involved, um, any questions you might have, free feel to answer them in the chat. Otherwise, over to you, Matt. Morning, everybody. Uh, I am just going to check the slides are working there. Uh, one second. Excellent. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Morning, everybody. Um, thanks, Sunny. Uh, my name is Matt Hadlington. I'm a senior business engagement manager at HS2. And my role is to work with the contractors who build the railway to try and involve local businesses uh, in the project wherever we can. Um, today, I'm just going to give you a quick update on the project, uh, let you know a little bit about it in case you don't already know. I think there's an awful lot of awareness of the project, but sometimes I think the knowledge is kind of a little bit down. So we'll try and to share a little bit more information on that and then talk through some of the kinds of opportunities that you might not have considered when thinking about the project. Um, and then also um, talk to you a little bit about ways to get involved. Um, so it's an unprecedented project in terms of scale and um, we've already contracted around 10 billion into the supply chain uh, and next year that that number will double um, we're going to mobilize the supply chain on a sort of pretty unprecedented scale um, and we want to kind of make sure that um, a lot of that money and a lot of those benefits land in the right place in terms of with our kind of immediate neighbors and uh, along the line of where the new railway travels so for those that you don't know, uh, HS2 is um, uh, Britain's new high-speed rail network. Uh, on the map there, you can see um, where it goes. So primarily today, we'll be talking about phase one, which is in the dark blue between Birmingham and London Euston. That is well underway already in terms of work happening. Uh, we're out on the ground. Um, then the sort of lighter blue um, between uh, Birmingham and Crewe, that's what we would call 2A. Um, that is currently going through Parliament and um, we're hoping to find out a little bit more on that one before the end of the year in terms of whether we have parliamentary approval to carry on with it. And then finally, phase 2B, which completes the network up to Manchester and Leeds, is shown here in, in uh, orange. Uh, and that is making its way through consultation at the moment. We just started a big consultation on the um, on the. Um, on that part of the railway. Um, so what you may not know is that HS2 also stops at 25 stations uh, and links up eight of Britain's kind of biggest cities. So the bit that everybody kind of focuses on, I think is between Birmingham and London, but actually when you take into account the kind of other existing networks that it stops at, um, it, stations that it stops at on the existing network, it starts to be a real, um, a real boost to connectivity for the country. Um, it's a pretty transformational project. I always think it's quite hard to get your head around, but the one thing that kind of always brings it into focus for me is say, if you lived in North London, um, when this project finished, you could arguably say that Birmingham International would be your closest airport. Um, so you would be able to get from sort of Euston to Birmingham International in around 30, 38 minutes, um, which is you know comparable to Heathrow and probably definitely quicker than Gatwick. So it just sort of gives you a feel for the kind of, you know, the way that this project will link the country up. Am I sort of correct to understand, is it about sort of 345 miles of track? Is that the whole thing or just a sort of first phase? That's the whole thing, yeah. The, the first phase is, uh, is significantly less than that. Um, but yeah, that, that's, the, that's the whole thing, yeah. Um, and then just moving on to where we are with the project, I think it's useful to know. So earlier in the year, we got a, a real big milestone for us, something called Notice to Proceed, um, which is essentially the Department for Transport giving us the kind of OK to carry on and to move money from government's accounts into HS2's accounts and then into the uh, main work civil contractor. So they're the four contractors who are going to build the majority of the railway for us. Um, I'll come on to how that works in a little bit. Um, and then 
also what happened earlier this year in September was that we moved from what we call enabling works, which is the sort of preparatory works to clear the way for the railway into the start of construction proper. Um, so that those were two big milestones for us this year that kind of really set the project on its way in terms of delivering benefits for, for businesses and people across the country. And finally, it would be remiss of me not to mention COVID. Um, it has had an impact on us. Um, we're still kind of establishing exactly what that impact is, um, but we're working in line with all of the guidance and actually the challenge to our contractors has been met in a way that's been really positive and actually they've Im implemented um, uh, lots of processes which actually are keeping helping to keep people safe both our workers and communities it's quite interesting I suppose if you consider it in one way the construction sites are fairly um, fairly self-contained so actually it's probably in some ways easier to implement processes to, to manage COVID in that situation than it is in sort of on high streets I suppose um, so we'll see the kind of impact and knock on impact on 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 that situation um as as the program progresses but at the moment things are happening and they're happening at, at pace in terms of us working to meet our program deadlines um so just a, a really quick one hopefully you can see that um this uh, apologies if this is sort of fairly obvious to some of you but um i always think it's worth mentioning um because i think a lot of people assume that to go and work on the hs2 project you would just get a contract with hs2 limited and um, that's not how this project will work so hs2 limited is essentially the arm's length government body um that is employed uh, and exists to manage the delivery of the railway we're a relatively small organization um I say relatively small, that's in comparison to some of the organisations working for us. So we're about um, 1,500 people um, and we're made up of sort of project managers, um, commercial teams, community engagement teams, I suppose support functions um, that kind of are responsible for setting the requirements and, and setting the rules of play in terms of how we'll build this railway. Uh, we're kind of responsible for managing the the legal side of things. So uh, we went through a hybrid bill process and now we have a piece of legislation which allows us to deliver the railway and we're sort of the named owner of that legislation. So we we manage the way that the railway is built um, and we contract the majority of the work out to um, tier one joint ventures. I'll come on to who they are in a second, but we tend to let really really large contracts um, often in the billions as opposed to the millions um, we do have some smaller contracts uh, where we, we let through a government portal and um, for our own purposes but the majority of the stuff we do is really big and actually the kind of benefits will really sit in with um, the tier one joint ventures that we have and their delivery partners that's where we think um, the majority of opportunities for uh for businesses to get involved in the project will come so just in terms of how we build the railway um, we've broken it up into multiple contracts um and this is just a little bit of a, an update on where we are with that procurements so um design and services work has already been awarded and is underway um, and that's been happening for some time since the sort of um, the start of the project um, enabling works is the thing that people may have seen out and about on the ground so far so that's the stuff that you need to do to clear the way for construction work we're moving um, moving services moving pipelines um, we're doing an awful lot of archaeological work you may have seen the tv show that was on um, bbc recently kind of looking at some of that work absolutely huge in scale never before done and then on the environmental side we're also relocating species and um, removing vegetation to clear the way for the new railway so that work has been ongoing since 2017 uh, and will continue in some places probably for another year or so some areas are a little bit further in head than another others depending on what's happening then the main work civils contract um, those are those there are four of those and I'll come on to who who does what where and that's the really big stuff that's the big ticket items that's um, that's our work to kind of start to build essentially what will be a, a, a bit of a dual carriageway or a motorway on which we will then lay the railway so that's the, the really big work and then they're, they're sort of starting to mobilize now uh, they are starting to hire the people they need and they're starting to buy the goods and services that they need to, to build things um, then we also have stations contracts 
uh, we've let contracts for Euston and Old Oak Common, and we are currently at tender for um, the two contractors to build the stations in Birmingham, uh, one in Curzon Street, which is in the city centre, and one um, in uh, Solihull, which is what we call Interchange Station. Uh, then there are some other things here. Uh, as I touched on, the utilities work is already out and, and working, and we tend to work with big utilities providers for that. Um, we're at to tender for the trains, so the rolling stock um, uh, already. And then at the moment, we are kind of currently launching our tender for the railway systems work. So that's the sort of tracks, signaling, uh, all of that kind of stuff um, that the railway will actually sit on. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of an update on where we are in terms of contracts. Just in terms of those big contracts, um, the stats on the left there, we we do we expect that those contracts will generate around 400,000 supply chain opportunities for UK businesses just during phase one. So those contracts on the right will be significant and then they will obviously have knock on impacts down into the supply chain in terms of um, uh, other contracts being generated that we will need to let. Uh, the other thing is we have um, an aspiration to, to make sure that SMEs benefit from this project. Uh, we expect around two thirds of the contracts to go to SMEs uh, and there'll be opportunities that are kind of created across a wide number of sectors. So let's just have a quick look at some of those sectors. Matt, um, so before we move yeah. on, a sort of couple of questions on a couple of people's slide. And a lot of questions we do get asked is around the sort of contracts and you know, how do people or businesses or individuals get contract working for HS2 Limited itself? But also on the other side is, you know, how can businesses get contact details of all the contractors that are currently working on the project? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so HS2 Limited itself, our contracts are let through a, a government portal, um, which, you know, I will share all the links. I'll share all the links at the end of the presentation. Um, but you have to go through a, a sort of fairly rigorous process to come and work for HS2 Limited itself. Um, and the opportunities actually are, are relatively small, I would say. Um, we're a bit like a government department in that respect. You have to go and become an approved supplier and get on a framework. Uh, and that can be kind of quite slow. Uh, in terms of the actual contractors, they use a, um, a platform which I'll come on to called Compete For, which is where all of their op opportunities are displayed. Uh, and that's where the tender process starts. Uh, it gives businesses kind of vis visibility of all of the of all of the contracts and opportunities um, that are generated by the project. And it also allows you to kind of see um, who's won contracts at various points. So uh, there's full transparency. So if you're, I don't know, if you're a fencing supplier, perhaps you can use Compete For and you can register, but you can see who maybe wins the site management contract for a specific scheme. So then you will know who to go and contact to kind of express an interest in that. So there's, the, there are multiple ways to get involved. And, and in terms of the contact details for the actual um, the actual contractors working, I'll, I'll share that um, after the, the presentation as well. Brilliant, thanks. So just to give you a feel for the kind of things that uh, we might need. So I think a lot of people think that it's just going to be tracks and trains, um, but actually it'll be a significant, uh, there's a significant list of things that we, we think we're going to need to build this railway. Uh, photographers um, to capture the work on site. We have specific requirements in our contracts to make sure that the, the, the contractors are reporting back on what they're doing. So we're able to tell the story of the railway. Um, food and catering, so not just kitchen setups and mobile caterers on site, but also things like catering for meetings and events uh, or just places for our workforce to go and get lunch on local high streets. It's a bit tricky at the moment with the COVID situations. We're acting in a kind of very responsible way. Um, and it, depending on where we are, we're trying to make sure our workers don't actually go into those high streets at the moment um, for fear of kind of, you know, compounding the problem. Um, so we're trying to be sensitive around that. But but when that sort of starts to unlock a little, I think there's opportunities there. We're going to have essentially a new market for, for biz local businesses near to our compounds. Um, accommodation and similar thing um, could be the provision of modular blocks on site, but also we're going to need bed and breakfast, hotels, private rentals for our office and construction staff. So huge different uh, types of accommodation needs there. Uh, all of our workers are going to need the things that you and I would need. So, um, you know, health and well-being needs like a uh, gym dentist hairdressers um they'll maybe be bringing their families sometimes to the area uh, if they're not already from the area and they will need things to do with them um transport and logistics could be taxi hire 
how you get to and from site or all the more sort of professional services in terms of logistics planning, transport planning, um, banksmen, that kind of thing. Um, and trade and uh, constructions is not just what we need to build the railway, but also to set up and compound. So building materials, electricals, plumbing, that kind of thing. And then other site services, um, such as cleaning, soft landscaping, waste management, site security. A lot of these will come through our tier one contractors, but some might come through their subcontractors. Each area will be slightly different in the way they approach it, but they're all going to essentially need the same thing. So it's a case of kind of trying to understand how each area is managed and then looking to see where your business might be able to take uh, advantage of that. So just in terms of a few ways that you can get involved, um, as I sort of touched on earlier, there will be kind of different arrangements depending on the types of contracts. So um, all of these kind of wide ranging supplies and services uh, mean that we need different ways to do that. So depending on the scale, you may be bidding through Compete for, like I said, um, for a larger framework contract, um, which will be uh, quite complex and more formal. You have to go through a tender process the same way that you would on any project. Um, and that can be sometimes a little a little uh, more rigorous but that's to justify the public spend and and things have to be done in the right way on a project of this nature sorry something you're going to ask a question yeah just sort of a couple of questions around you talk about sort of supply chain and you know the mm. usual suppliers often the case happens with these large sort of infrastructure projects you know these contracts usually go to the usual big suppliers are you guys proposing any steps to ensure that contracts of this sort of nature don't go to the usual big suppliers as they normally do but also we talk about payments and often there's quite a lot of small businesses involved is there a way that you guys can ensure sort of prompt payment to small businesses yeah so on the first point you're absolutely right um and i think there's a as a sort of element of reality with this situation in that this is a, a massive project um, funded by the taxpayer and we have to ensure value for the taxpayer so there will be cases where um you know where uh, one of our tier one contractors will already have an existing relationship with um, a business or a supplier that can provide a certain thing um, and it may be cheaper more efficient quicker cleaner to sort of to sort of allow them to do that but the requirement we put on them is that they advertise all opportunities through compete for and it's an open and fair tender process so um that's one way we do that is through the use of this tendering platform. But also there are kind of, I suppose, softer requirements on them. Um, first of all, they have to hit the sort of 60% uh, SME num number. So they have to make sure that they are bringing in um, businesses of a certain size and scale. And also um, it's kind of in their interest to to make sure that they utilize local firms, local businesses as much as possible. Um, they're kind of going to be judged, I guess, on three things, kind of program uh, and cost, which are kind of almost given for us because we have to build this railway on time and on budget. But then the third thing is the kind of experience of the communities and the local businesses in the area uh, that we work. And one way to kind of to, to, to have a positive impact on that is to involve businesses in the project. So uh, as a client, um, it's incredibly important to us that they demonstrate the value they're adding to local communities and local businesses. Um, and actually, as well as just uh, letting contracts, they're also um, expected to kind of upskill local business communities. Um, so they are not just expected to go to market and say, OK, there's nobody here who can do this job. They're expected to have a look at the market. They have to demonstrate contractually to us that they've done that. And if there are gaps, they also have to show what they've done to try and upskill businesses that may be interested in getting involved in the project. So there are a number of things that kind of help with that. Uh, on the payment terms, um, all HS2 uh, enabling works and main work contractors have signed up to our fair payment charter. Um, they also are required to pass down the fair payment principles that they've signed up to down through their supply chain. So um, there are a number of um, there are a number of kind of safeguards there that we've put in place. I think the other thing on that is is that um, certainly at the moment we kind of we're hyper aware of, of our responsibility as, as one of the sort of bigger projects uh, that's going in the current sort of situation. And we've actually been trying to speed up our payment in ahead of that. Um, so even to beat our own kind of fair payment terms to try and make sure that money's landing in the part at the right time to, to give people the support that they need. So 
uh, yes, there are things we can do. Um, it's a massive project. There will always be difficulties. And I think the key thing for us is to try and be open, try and be transparent and try and have that communication. So if businesses are finding that that's a problem, um, we as a client want to know about it so that we can pick it up with our contractors working on their behalf and, and make sure that they're, they're sort of, they're not, uh, that that doesn't happen very often. Um, Without going into too much detail, the sort of process, if, if, if a small business is getting, you know, there are say, for a long payment term from some of the supply chain and what's the sort of process in the case of coming to you guys directly how do they get in touch yeah i mean in the first instance they would talk to um they would talk to the the person they were in contract with obviously uh, but as soon as that is exhausted i suppose the way i should think of it is that hs2 limited as the client is there to safeguard um to safeguard businesses and also safeguard communities. So there is a supply chain team within HS2 where they're very easily contactable. I think their email address is scc at hs2.org.uk. Um, and that is the place that I would go um, if you're having issues around that and they will look into it. The amount of reporting burden that we put on the contractors is pretty vast uh, and that goes all the way down through the supply chain. So we have oversight of everything that they're doing essentially. Um, and if there are specific issues, that's the place to go and we can pick that up as a client. Um, and there's an awful lot of sort of pain and gain in, in the contracts that we let with these, these big joint ventures. Um, just picking up uh, on the other types of, of ways to get involved other than formal contracts, there will also be short form contracts where, um, you know, we, we we will just need some stuff kind of quickly on site so that they'll go through a formal kind of process there, but it'd be less rigorous than the sort of main framework contract type thing. And similarly with purchase orders, um, there'll be points in time where we need things on site and um, we'll have processes set up to allow our workforce to just go and buy the things that they need so there's sort of multiple layer, layers of, of opportunities to get involved and I suppose it's just thinking about that um, and at what point you feel like your business might be able to kind of enter that that process and then the last thing on the right is I touched on it before it's, it's that worker choice and I don't think we should kind of underestimate that at peak this project will employ 30,000 people uh, in the building and designing of the railway and they're all going to need a place to stay somewhere to eat and they're all going to probably need things to buy so um offering a service to our workers is a real opportunity on this project and probably not one to kind of i suppose just dismiss uh in that sense um so just quickly moving on i think it's worth mentioning that the work that's happened so far just to give you a few examples uh, it's already starting to kind of have some benefits we've got 2,000 businesses already working on the project uh, a thousand of those are what we would call local businesses uh, near to the line of route and uh, over three quarters of them are SMEs um, on the right hand side there's just a few images um, I, I won't go through them all in detail but these are just businesses that are already benefiting and it's quite interesting to kind of just talk through their stories in some way so in the top left corner you've got a, a company called Trinity Assets um, they are based in Coles Hill, which is very near to one of our big compounds just outside of Birmingham. Uh, and they're an accommodation provider. Uh, and what they've done is essentially um, they had one or two properties at the start of the project where they, they had an aspiration to house young professionals. Um, but they saw an opportunity in terms of HS2's workers coming to site. I think there's a couple of hundred people on the compound there. Uh, just part of the enabling works and that will grow during the main works and they well they they went down to site with an ice cream van on the hottest day of the year and um, told all their workers about their their offer in terms of their accommodation uh, and they um, they were able to attract sort of I think 10 10 or 15 of our people to stay with them in their in their in their properties but well they also are as a property developer so they they looked at the kind of workforce requirements for HS2 in their area they literally went to site and talked to a site manager and said what's going to happen you know and found out in real terms what was going to happen over the next year and then they went away and they started to kind of buy and develop property in the area um, with a HS2 in mind and then also um, Jaguar Land Rover and some of the big businesses in mind um, and they and they've essentially built their business from kind of two properties up to um, I think they're housing around 60 or 70 people now and they've got a waiting list of, of, of 20 or 30 extra people and they've they've got about 20 projects forecasted for next year and they hire all from the local economy 
all their workforce are local people or their builders or their subbies. Um, they also insist on um, having an apprentice on site. So every every sort of specialism that they hire, they, they insist on having that they have a, a young person with them to train them up. So they've really aligned themselves with kind of what the HS2 project's all about. And in terms of how they house our workers also, they've really thought about it. So they've, they've put it in a sort of a price point that's really attractive to our workforce. They've made, made the places where they stay kind of like home from home for them. Um, so that you know, there's no issues around um, worker behavior because they feel sort of welcome. It's a really interesting model and one that they've kind of really taken and run with. And they're, they're a great example of a really small business who don't have a contract at all with HS2, but they're just, you know, they're just, thinking on their feet and they're, they're, they're being quite quick uh, and and intelligent about how they approach the opportunity uh, then just the other guys you've got um in the bottom right hand corner you've got a guy called chris who's smileier than he looks in that picture but he's based uh he's based near one of our sites on curzon street and he uh he does all of our printing so he does uh, all of our notification letters all of our newsletters all of the updates that we do all the stuff that they need on site um so he's got uh, he's got a contract with us there and then just in the bottom left i'll just finish on kirsty she uh, runs a charitable organization called Woodshack. And they have a, an arrangement with our fencing contractor where they can come to site to clear away um, a fencing that's no longer required or to where they where we first take access to a site, they can go on and they can get any uh, any waste wood. And what they do is they take that away and they use it. They use it to um, uh, they use it as part of a social social enterprise where they they put people back to work who's had a hard time so they take that wood and they do something good with it is what they is, is how they talk about it and they um they've they've had access to to hs2 sites which has made a massive difference to them in terms of how many people they've been able to help so th those are just a, a few small examples to kind of get you thinking in a slightly different way um and then in terms of what to do next um there are a few things and i'll go through these so I think the first thing to do, oh, and there's a typo in that, which is not very good. That's my fault. So in the top left-hand corner, you've got the uh, gray circle, um, and we would ask you to kind of tell us what you do and put yourself on the map. So you can go to hs2.org.uk forward slash local dash business, and that should be business spelt correctly, sorry. Um, and what there is there is a very short registration form where you can kind of tell us about your business, tell us about what you do. It's a very simple form. And what happens is that comes to me and my team and we have a regular uh, catch up with all of the procurement leads from the joint ventures, the big tier one joint ventures. And what we do is we, we kind of look at their procurement pipeline and we say, OK, in this area, there are X and this is what the local um, a local community can provide in terms of, of these businesses. Um, and then we can't tell them what to do with their money. But as the client, we can kind of say, look, we're making you aware of the offer of the local community uh, and we want you to consider that. Uh, in terms of how you meet some of the requirements we've put on you. So I think that's a really simple, quick way of letting us know what you do and where you are. Secondly is to sign up for, to compete for. And I think if, if you were only to do one or two things after this, it would be to do these two things in the top left hand corner, because they're the two things that will give you a sight of what's happening, sight of opportunities, and that will also let us know what you do. Um, so if you sign up to compete for, you'll see all of the opportunities as they, as they go up. And you, as I say, you also can track them and sort of see who's won what so that you can get involved uh, in other ways. And that's definitely a key place to go. Uh, then keep up to date. So um, that that will tell you sort of um, if you go to the In Your Area page, you'll be able to register and you will be able to see what is happening. So that's where we publish our notifications, kind of advanced look forward looks on what we're doing in specific areas so there's, there's there'll be one that's kind of closer to you that you can register for and that will give you a really clear idea of the kind of work that's coming up so you can start to see and get a feel for what's happening in your part of the world with the project um also you can go and look at hs2.org and understand kind of how we work so when i gave that example of, of trinity assets that's what they'd done they understood what, what, what the values that were important to us and they kind of reflected them back to us and actually that made them a really attractive proposition for our contractors because they're able to point to them as an example and we're talking about them today and um, because they're doing things in the kind of the right way um also, um, to get more detail, there's a, in the bottom left-hand corner, we ran a series of webinars, um, which which went into an awful lot more detail, where we brought uh, supply chain specialists from HS2, um, people from Compete4, uh, and 
other parts of the business to kind of talk through what you need to do to be um, to be able to kind of get involved in the project in more detail. So there's a, there's, there's a webinar series there which you can go to uh, and um, and find out more. Uh, they're sort of hour long sessions with Q and A's. Um, and you can just watch those whenever you like or download, download them for further watching. They're really useful. Um, the middle one is, is um, Supply Chain School. So we are part of a collection of construction companies who fund the Supply Chain School. This is a completely free resource and not many people seem to know about it, which always surprises me. But you can go on there and you can do free um, training uh, modules, which give you um, recognition uh, and actually um, that it's sort of like badges, I suppose, a bit like construction line, um, which are recognized by our, our tier one suppliers. So, you know, you could go and do modules in EDI policy or health and safety, um, environmental uh, issues, all the things that are important to us. And, and you can get to a point where you've got these qualifications um, and our, that will help you in your tender, in your tender process with us and then finally we would just say um speak to your local chamber you know you've already done that bit today because that's how you're here um but we are doing an increasing amount of work with local business organizations uh, to make sure that opportunities are, are passed out and also that we're trying to do our bit to kind of upskill businesses to be ready for those opportunities Thank you. Um, matt another question apologies um the sort of compete no pool platform um Another sort of question or comment we get from a lot of sort of local businesses is because they're quite small, it can be quite an onerous platform to use. You know, they don't often have the resources or the bandwidth internally to go through the whole process. Is there any sort of support help with perhaps registering or using the platform? Yes. So I would say it, definitely go and watch the specific episode episode on, um, on Compete For on our Work With Us Wednesdays uh, session. So we have representatives from that business come in and, and literally talk through the nuts and bolts of using the platform um, and they also give you some kind of tips in terms of how to get the most out of it um, so they do that but they also provide contacts um, for themselves so if you're having issues in terms of what you what you need to fill out um, they'll tell you sort of what the bare minimum is that you need to be able to provide to get on there the idea is it's open it's free it's transparent so it's it's one of those things that um we do provide information and support around so go and go and watch that but also it is i for me it's worth spending a bit of time and if it's not something that you're necessarily familiar with or that you you, you know you don't have the bandwidth for I, I understand that but i would say to persevere with it because i think it what it does is it gives you a real oversight of, of what is happening in the supply chain in hs2's overall whole supply chain you know you you if you spend a bit of time on it like the rewards you get back i think would be uh, far outweigh the, the sort of the time that you put into it so yeah go to watch the webinar but also um uh, that they provide their contact details if you've got any more specific questions as well great thank you and then um, I think that's nearly me. So we'll have some time for some um, for some questions now, if there are any. So um, all those links that were just on, sorry, I'll uh, just jump back. Um, all those links that are, are on there, we can share after the webinar. These slides are happy to share as well, if, if Sunny is happy with that. Um, so those are the kind of key links in terms of where you need to go uh, and what you need to find out and what you need to read um, in terms of hs2 and opportunities so that's a really quick run through um to just try and give you an overview um of the project and, and how to get involved so if anybody has any questions i'm happy to try and take those now um Brilliant. Uh, i can't see any in the uh, yeah, panel no questions at the moment i'll give everyone a couple of minutes we did have some questions that came through so sort of earlier via email um a couple of questions around i guess the current situation that we're currently in covid19 and the wonderful world that we can't live in as it is um I guess it might be sort of a lot personal for quite a lot of businesses locally, especially. Do we still need haters too, considering a lot more people working from home? But also going back to the whole point around local businesses, SME, often with these large infrastructure projects, the term local can be quite broad. Is there a definition that you guys use in terms of local? Yeah, so I'll start with that one. Um, that's probably a bit easier. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we sort of... We sort of classify uh, a local business as, as one that's kind of in a county next to the route. But really, HS2 is going to have benefits for 
businesses across the UK, you know, there are businesses in Northern Ireland working on this project, there are businesses in Europe working on this project. It's there's enough got this kind of enough to go around and and Thames Valley is is very much a neighbor of the project. Um so I'd class Thames Valley businesses absolutely um as as local. Um I think it's it's kind of a bit of a it's a bit there's, there's sort of two ways to look at it. I think uh, the immediate desire from my team and 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 the community engagement team that we're sort of a part of is to is to try and offset the impact so um you know if you're if you're a business in a in a town or village that abuts the construction site that's going to feel a lot of the pain of the project and, and that and that is going to happen because it's a massive construction project um we want to try and make sure that you get the benefits as well um so that that's the first kind of definition of local but then also there's the whole regional economies piece and we recognize the sort of opportunity that we've got to help boost regional economies at a difficult time so i think those are the two definitions of local for me those immediately impacted and then those kind of regional economies that just abut the line of the new railway if that makes sense and in terms of do we need hs2 so i think i think time time will tell in, in some respects in terms of the sort of um the way we work with COVID. Um, but yes, we absolutely do need HS2. So I think there's a few ways to look at it. Um, you know, HS2 is a key part of helping Britain uh, meet its net zero targets on carbon. Um, the stat that kind of always jumps out at me is that during the 100 year life cycle of the railway and including all of the, the construction um, that we that we need to do to build the railway so during its entire operational lifespan and the time that it takes to build it and all the construction traffic associated with that um it would only generate i think it's three weeks worth of the uk road networks carbon so you get a feel for just how even with the construction how green this project is um so you know it's it's a key cornerstone of, the, of government's policy in terms of trying to um trying to get us down to net zero so from that perspective absolutely we need it and the other piece here that i think um is is important not to forget is it's just capacity generally you know yes more and more people are working at home um but the railway um but they also buying more things and doing more things so actually there's a requirement to get things as well as people around this country uh, and hs2 if you think of it um in its purest sense is something that delivers capacity and how we use that capacity can change and move and flex in the future. So the current business case, which is very robust, is based on moving people around the country. Um, but what we can also do is if you remove services from the existing network onto HS2, it frees up space for more freight, it frees up space to take, I think one train takes, one freight train can take something like 76 lorries off the road. So you start to see how the the building of capacity is different to the building of a passenger railway and hs2 is very much a capacity builder how we use that capacity over the next hundred years will flex and change in much in in the same way as the current railway does so yes my feeling is very much that we still need hs2 and in the short term we need it as a, an economic stimulus you know um as i say i think thirty thousand people working on the project four hundred thousand supply chain opportunities um businesses need some of that at the moment and people will need work so yes i think we do need hs2 is in the short answer Brilliant, thank you um, we've got a question coming live um i guess a couple of questions thank you very much for the questions mario uh, the first one's around sort of the budget um 100 billion pound how do we know that it's not going to double or triple by the end of the contract and as a sort of follow-on what penalties are built into the project to ensure adherence to the budget yeah so in terms of the phase one part of the project it, the funding envelope is 44 billion and, and actually there's been quite a bit of misreporting uh, around around that um we're within that budget we're within the agreed funding envelope um we've set out some efficiencies that we want to make which is kind of largely what's been reported in the press um to, to deliver the whole railway yes it's it is circa around 100 billion but again that is within the specified funding envelope of the project um so we are on time uh, and we are our budget at the moment the covid piece is something that needs to be calculated in terms of what that does um and in terms of how do we know the budget's not going to double or triple by the end of the project at the moment we have a limited amount of money that we can draw down on that is it uh it, it, we we 
can't we can't go back to government and ask for more we've got the money that we've got so we have to build it for that price at the moment um a project like this has never been done before so we are going to find things we are going to come across things that will impart costs um you know i think the in terms of the what the enabling work found there was an awful lot of stuff in the ground in simple terms that meant the costs have had to go up but we're working to bring that down in other places so it's a challenge um i can't sort of stay here now and say that we won't have an increasing price because it depends entirely on, on how the project goes um but in terms of penalties to ensure adherence to the budget the budget is is the budget there's there's that much money there and that's what we've got to spend so um our contractors are judged as i said on program and cost so they will need to um, put in place um the measures and the processes to bring the project in on time and if they if they don't adhere to that then they'll be penalized in terms of what they get paid so it's in their interest to build it it's in everybody's interest to build this project on time and on budget but it's a complicated thing there's no getting away from it it's a huge challenge um so it's going to throw up issues as, as we go nobody's tried to do this before um is the simple thing wonderful thank you um a couple more sort of pre uh questions that came in beforehand um obviously given the current situation a lot of people unfortunately out of work um how do individuals get a job on the hs2 project um, and obviously for businesses who are going through sort of difficult times, is there any sort of funding available for the HST project for businesses? Yeah, so there's a couple of things here. Um, the On the job side, um, the jobs will come in a very similar way to the contracts, I suppose. So um, HS2 Limited will, is, in, is currently looking to hire about 400 people between sort of Birmingham and London. Um, uh, between their Birmingham and London offices um, so you can go to HS2's website it's hs2.org.uk forward slash careers and look at roles there with HS2 but then the real weight of job opportunities when we talk about some of that 30,000 figure that I mentioned before they'll come with the contractors um, I've just realized that the slide I, I it's my part I've taken the slide out so after this Sonny I'll share the slide that has the the details of the contractors and and their detail and their contacts on um, there are four uh, balfa bt vinci who work between um, birmingham and leamington spa then you've got uh, afarge kia who work between leamington spa and sort of down roughly to the m25 a company called align um, who are joint venture including Bouig, the french company they're building the chilton's tunnel and the uh, colne valley viaduct and then inside the M25, a company called um, SCS, and they're building all of the sort of London, I suppose, London-based um, London based infrastructure for the project. So they all have their in the own individual careers pages, um, and I'll circulate all that after the, after the call. Um, and that would be the place to go. In terms of funding, um, HS2 does, doesn't have any funding available directly for individual businesses, but what is available is, is something called the Business and Local Economies Fund. Um, that's joined with the Community and Environment Fund. So we have a fund of around £40 million. I think we've spent around £7 million of that so far after the last three years. Um, and what that is, is that Business organisations actually like the Chamber, the LEP, the Growth Hub, um, any recognised business organisation, <coughs> excuse me, can apply for a, a, a grant, essentially free money um, to, uh, to put in place um, a programme or, a, or a, a plan that will help support local businesses that are impacted potentially by the project. Um, so that that's something to think about and that's something to look into um you know we have a couple that are already in existence um in buckinghamshire where the focus is upskilling local businesses preparing them um, and it kind of goes beyond hs2's impacts as well a, a little really um and the, that that those awards can be anything from seventy five thousand pounds up to a million pounds so really big strategic funding available for business organizations to support their local business communities so not directly to businesses but indirectly through business groups brilliant thank you right okay, so i think we have any more questions and i haven't had any more questions uh, come beforehand so at least i say thank you very much for matt um 
a copy and a recording of this webinar will be on our website and our YouTube page for those that have missed it. Um, our contact details again are at the start of this presentation for anyone that wants to get in touch with myself or Matt, feel free to do so. And again, thank you very much for Matt, thank you very much for HS2. Um, and uh, we'll slowly sort of come to the end of this uh, webinar. Just slowly, quickly moving on. Um, we haven't finished with our webinars, there's still loads more going on. Uh, just to mention a few, again, formal details can be found on our website. Um, Wednesday 21st, we're talking about, really about the sort of positive impact that social responsibility will have on your business. Um, that's with CSR accreditation on the 21st of October again, and then we'll double header for you guys. We're looking at sort of five dilemmas for 2020 and beyond and what looking at how to mitigate currency risk. That's with Infinity Foreign Exchange. Um, 27th of October, obviously we're coming towards the end of the transition period. We are going to be with the British Standards Institute and Bayes. We're going to be looking at what will happen in relation to project standards and conformity post the transition period. Moving on, 28th of October, we're looking at challenges again around data security with mm -hmm. a couple of businesses, Accelerate Technology and Build Beacon Consultant Services. And then last but not least, a couple of networking events for those that do enjoy a bit of networking over Zoom. 3rd of November, we'll give you opportunities to network with members from all seven regions of the Thames Valley. And then on the 10th of November, an opportunity for members and non-members to really help inform you about key information and ensure that your organisation is fully briefed on the benefits of your chamber membership. Final slide, EU Transition Hub. Obviously, we're coming towards the end of the transition period. If you need any help, support, or guidance, any aspect of international trade, we have created a transition hub to help you guide you and provide any information that you need with questions about international trade and the transition period. Please get in touch. Details are again there on the slide or via the website. Um, that's it from me. Again, final thank you to Matt and HS2. Thank you. The recordings of this presentation will be on our website later on. Um, and hopefully, I'll like seeing you all on a future webinar or networking event. Thank you very much. See you soon. Stay safe.